uh, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan or, or pass the microphone virtually over to Jonathan to tell you a little bit about himself. Okay, well, thank you, James. Uh, well, as you see on the slide there, the uh, key thing about my think is that I've spent many years using your software. Uh, it says more than 23 years. I think it's just coming up to 24 now. Uh, I have to point out that in that 24 years, I have never been an employee of Oracle Corporation. I've actually been self-employed. I've been freelance for about 28 years now. And after four years of general computer-related topics, it, uh, I, I happened to come into Oracle and stuck with that ever since. Uh, the type of work I do is... Hi, Jonathan. Sorry to... Work. Um, Hi, Jonathan. Sorry yeah. to sorry to interrupt you. Yes. Uh, the, you're, you're a little bit quiet and a little bit of crackling on your microphone. Oh, no again. Okay. Uh, is that any improvement? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I won't repeat what I've said so far, uh, apart from uh, 24 years or thereabouts working with the Oracle software. Um, and I've written three books and contributed to three other books. And the type of work I do nowadays is largely high-level consultancy. Uh, quite a lot of it is the training side, the presentation side, uh, some of them public seminars, some of them private seminars uh, for companies, uh, some of them, of course, stuff like this, the, the sort of uh, user group events and so forth. Um, and then, of course, troubleshooting a couple of days here and there to, to help sort out problems or direct companies in the best use. And I think that probably sums me up. Um, for the people from SQL Server who, who haven't come across my name before. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Grant to tell you a little bit about himself as well. Oh, well, like the slide says, my name is Grant Fritchie. I'm a SQL Server MVP. Um, for the Oracle people, it's MVP is most valuable professional, um, not person. Anyway, um, I speak at um, international events. I've published a couple of books of my own. And I'm also in four other uh, SQL Server books. Um, and um, I'm pretty much a big nerd. Um, I'm not the president of the Southern New England SQL Server's users group anymore. I keep trying to get that one corrected. Um, but I was one of the founding members. I did serve as his president for like uh, about five years. Um, and I still help out with those guys. Um, I blog at scarydba.com. Please stop by. And um, that's enough about me. You guys want to talk tech. You don't want to talk about us. So let's move on. Thank you, Grant. Sure. Okay, so, so we're now going to kick off the, the main discussion today, uh, which, as I said a number of times, is Oracle Heap Tables or SQL Server Clustered Indexes. We thought what would be a, a good idea to start with is to actually explain a little bit about the different structures, uh, so the different way that Oracle is structured and, different way, and, and the way that SQL Server is structured. So Jonathan's going to start things off by talking about uh, the Oracle structure, before Grant talks about SQL Server structure, and then we'll start to we'll sort of move into a bit more of a, a live discussion. In, in it's worth noting that this isn't a kind of a scripted discussion. Uh, so hopefully, both Jonathan and Grant are going to learn a few things as they go along, and, and everybody in the audience will too. As I, as I mentioned before, please feel free to put questions in the question panel as we go along. So, without further ado, uh, let's kick this discussion off. Okay, James. Well, let's uh, look at Oracle then. Uh, obviously, one of the problems we're going to have as we go through the hour are differences in terms when we mean the same thing or different meanings for the same terms. So just as one quick throwaway at the beginning, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, if a person in Oracle talks about an Oracle block, uh, that's basically the same as someone in SQL Server talking about a page. Uh, so uh, if, I, if I choose the term, which is not the one you're most familiar with, that's the, the obvious translation. So what we're going to look at, uh, just very briefly, is a description of heap tables, index organized tables, which are the closest equivalent that Oracle has to the clustered index for uh, SQL Server, and then the things that Oracle calls clusters. And just to keep things really confusing, Oracle has things called index clusters, which are nothing like clustered indexes. So, heap tables, uh, SQL Server has exactly the same sort of concept, of course. Um, table, uh, table data, heap tables, the data simply arrives, it's just stacked into place in the data segment in the next available slot. There's no careful location of data in certain positions, easy access, anything like that. 
the data is literally simply, here's the next row, bang it on the heap. Uh, on top of the heap tables, of course, we do then build indexes. Typically, we could categorize this as saying we build B tree indexes, balanced uh, B tree indexes uh, for OLTP systems, and a few B trees, of course, in data warehouses and decision support systems. And when it comes to data warehouses, though, so you tend to have the bitmap indexes. Uh, B tree indexes, I believe, just the same as they are in SQL Server. Um, balanced structures. Um, we tend to talk about root blocks, branch blocks, and lead blocks as we descend from the focal point of the index downwards to the tail end of the index, from which we then have row, get row addresses or row IDs, to use the Oracle term, which points to specific rows in the table. So an entry in a B tree index corresponds to a row in a heap table. Bitmap indexes are much denser structures. A single entry in a bitmap index could potentially identify tens or even hundreds of thousands of rows in the table by a bitmap pattern. A string of uh, ones and zeros basically saying, I have a key value. This string of ones and zeros corresponds to many consecutive rows in the table. If there's a one here, it represents uh, a row which holds a key value. If there's a zero, it's either a missing row or a row which does not hold a value. So that's the basic heap table. I, I doubt if there's very much difference in that respect between Oracle and SQL Server, but I look forward to hearing Grant speaking about them. In Thank the you, Jonathan. Oh, sorry. So, yeah. sorry, Jonathan. Sorry, I, I thought you'd, you'd gone through that part. Uh, again, we've got a few comments coming in from the, the audience that the sound's a little bit quiet. Oh, right, okay. Uh, unfortunately, I, I really can't do anything about this. I, um, I, I will just speak up as loudly as I can and hold the mic as close as I can to my, my mouth. So, so um, as you're speaking now is, is good, I can, I can hear that clearly. All right, that, that must be because I've got little red lights flashing in front of me. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, so if we shift on to index organized tables, basically with Oracle you have a primary key. Uh, it has to be unique and not null. That gives you the, the definition of primary key. Uh, and the index organized table simply says we have a primary key index feature structure, but carried by each key entry, we have all the other columns that belong to that specific row in the table. In that respect, then, I believe uh, index organized tables are as close as we can get to clustered indexes for SQL Server. Uh, the important point, of course, in Oracle, the index organized table has to have this uniqueness on the index. Uh, the other structure, then, is the cluster. Essentially, this is a mechanism Oracle has which says, in a fashion similar to indexing, Items of data which look similar go into the same place. So you can declare a cluster key on a table of data or even a set of tables of data, which essentially says if this column or uh, this two or three or up to 16 columns, I think, if the values in this column are the same for many rows, these rows should be placed in the same block, in the same page in the table. Now, as far as our office is concerned, there are actually two strategies for clusters. One is the index cluster, which says, this is an open-ended structure. We find all the rows for a given key value because we have a very small index where each key appears just once, but that key tells us which page to go to to find all the rows that match that key. There's also a thing called a hash cluster, which is much more restrictive which basically says you predefine the total volume of data you expect so Oracle can pre-allocate the space for it, and then we work out arithmetically where a row should go based on a hash function which we apply to the key values in the columns. At that point, I think I'll stop and hand over to Grant. Okay? Okay, well, let's talk. I'm going to actually talk heap tables first and then talk clustered indexes, um, just because the, the structures kind of make sense that way. SQL Server is really kind of based around the idea of the clustered index. Now, we support heap tables, but the real structure that, that they've kind of built everything around is the clustered index. Now, heap, it sounds like it's almost exactly like um, Oracle. It's basically as the data comes in, it gets allocated to a given page. Um, that page may or may not be in order. It may be the next page. It may be a page way further away from the disk um, from the previous page. But there's what's called an index allocation map page that keeps track of where everything's at for a table 
that doesn't have a clustered index. And so what you get is this sort of row ID that allows you to locate where a particular row is inside of this map. And it's, um, it's just not terribly efficient. And um, SQL Server doesn't really work well with it um, just because of the way um, more or less Windows accesses the data. Um, it's not good for sorting. It's not good for retrieving sorted data. It's not good for finding data because you have to do multiple lookups to first find the, um, the, the, the data you're looking for and then find the row ID for that data to retrieve it. So instead, we have these things called clustered indexes. Now, it sounded really interesting listening to the Oracle stuff because the index organize table sounds almost identical to a clustered index. Now, a clustered index, by default, if you do nothing else, when you create a table and you create a primary key on that table, that becomes your clustered index. But a clustered index does not have to be the primary key. But the really interesting thing is, is that a clustered index does have to be unique. But further, you don't have to make it unique. There's um, inside of SQL Server, there's a thing called a uniqueifier that you can get on a clustered index to make the key values unique, so that so that it can sort them out again into a B tree structure exactly the same way as Oracle does. Um, so ultimately, it sounds like structurally we're talking about exactly the same thing, if not something really, really similar. It's just the, the main point that we have is on the SQL Server side is that's where we go by default. We go straight to clustered indexes immediately. Now, we do offer a whole slew of other types of indexes, but we're talking XML indexes, full text indexes, um, spatial indexes, and these are all stored in some ways radically different, in some ways the same. I mean, for example, spatial indexes is actually stored inside of a B tree, but it's, oh boy, is it a strange looking B tree when you try to pull the information out. Um, but uh, these indexes are very different. By and large, what we're talking about here are clusters and heaps, and it sounds like they are used exactly the same way. The real question is, is why are the Oracle people so focused on not using the ordered data structure, whereas in SQL Server we are very, very focused on using that doubly linked list of clustered indexes, um, of pages um, on a clustered index to make sure that we get data back in, or, or put data in, in, a, in an ordered fashion. And it's just interesting that, that you know, we're very focused on that order and you guys just seem less so. Jonathan. <laughs> right, okay, yes. Um, yes, I was interested in your comment about um, SQL Server um, heaps not being very efficient. Um, and also, of course, your, your question about why, why Oracle people are so focused on not using uh, clustered indexes. Um, I, think, uh, I think I'll follow up on the focused on not using clustered indexes. Uh, first, um, I have to say, to my mind, a great deal of designing the system properly comes down to knowing how you're going to use the data and making sure that you put your data in the right place to start with. Um, so I, I am constantly actually battled by the fact that index organized tables and clusters very rarely appear in Oracle database systems. And it's, uh, it has been a long time uh, mantra of mine that if a system has nothing but, if an application is designed with nothing but heap tables and B-tree indexes, it's probably been, uh, it's probably running suboptimally. It probably should have some structures other than just heap tables and, and B-tree indexes. The, the reason I think perhaps why um, Oracle applications tend to see few index organized tables in real life is simply the default choice is a heap table. Um, in much the same way, I guess, that uh, I see SQL server sites, which all seem to have nothing but clustered indexes, 
because the default choice in SQL Server is a trusted index on a primary key. Um, right. Well, I mean, I mean, we hit the same issues that you're hitting, though, because what we get is the people that use the defaults, mm -hmm. and you know, your defaults is heaps, and you know, and then B tree index. Our defaults is a cluster, and and B tree indexes, but the issues become the same because people will just accept the default and the interesting thing is is that frankly the primary key is not always the best thing to create a clustered index on there may be other column or another column or columns inside that table that the data would be better stored as a cluster using that column or columns but but because people are using the defaults they you know they've just gone to the primary key in in every instance yeah, now that's that's a really interesting point. Um, I mean, we, we've got this slide up which says uh, examining misconceptions. Um, I mean, one of the misconceptions I may have uh, as an example here is that um, I seem to see SQL Server people creating their tables with a primary key, which is a completely artificial primary key. They simply add an identity column, I think you call it, a unique number column to the table and say that's my primary key and now I've got a trusted index because I declared that as my primary key. And essentially they're using a trusted index but they're not doing any useful clustering with it. They're effectively saying it's now a B tree structure and the data is clustered in the order in which it physically came into the database because it's clustered around the as primary key. I mean, is, is that is that uh, a ridiculous exaggeration of what really happens, or is, or is that uh, in your sight a sort of fairly common what I would call error? Oh, that's not an exaggeration at all. No, that's exactly what happens. Now, the the interesting thing though is is that by and large, and again, this isn't this is not universal, and there are certainly exceptions, but by and large, that is actually a very efficient way to work with SQL Server. The whole monotonically increasing value for a cluster key is actually a very, very good choice for the cluster, depending on how you're retrieving the data. Um, most of the time, you're looking at either um, a primary key, in which case you're pulling back a row, in which case the using the clustered index is a great mechanism for, for pulling that data back, because it, it gives you very few seeks across the pages of the B tree to get down to where the data is stored, or, depending on, again, depending on your design, it's part of a foreign key, in which case, again, you're pulling back a set of data that was stored in order in a, in a particular location, um, and that's clustered, and, and then you get stuff back. But the problem we run into is, is that people just slap an identity value on there, and then they've got an efficient, you know, what, what, what we would consider an efficient storage mechanism, but then they're not retrieving it based on that storage mechanism. They're retrieving it based on other values you know, either uh, either with or without indexes, and then they then they're either getting into into clustered index scans, or they're getting into what we call a key lookup, which is a, a situation where they look it up on the index, but then still have to go and read through the clustered index to find the data. So it it you know it becomes a self defeating thing if it's not designed. Yeah. It, I mean, can, can I come back to that business about the the efficiency of the thing being clustered on? a primary key on an identity. Um, sure. You see, I think this comes back to a comment you made about the, the clustered index being more efficient. But if you are using primary key lookups, or, uh, I'm sorry, single row by primary key, or if you're looking up um, foreign keys, so you've, you've got the primary key from the parent, and then you go and fetch all the rows that relate to that based on a clustered index, uh, they're really shouldn't be, or at least in Oracle terms, there wouldn't be any significant difference in performance between using an index organized table and using a uh, heap table, um, largely because of the effects of the rest of the data. Uh, I mean, you're going to have to wave my hands a little bit here, and, and obviously this is a question of exactly what does the data look like, but if you're talking about choosing between a heap table with B tree index and a clustered index, well, if you put your table data into your index, your index is much bigger. So it's easy to envisage cases where you might say, 
If I've got my clustered index, I visit the wood block, I come to a branch block, I hit a leaf block, and I've got my table row in that leaf block. But if you replace that with a heap table and a B tree index, simple B tree, you could easily be in a position where you said, I hit my root block, I hit my leaf block immediately because the index is, you know, an order of magnitude smaller, possibly even two orders of magnitude smaller, and then I go to the table block. In either case, you visit the same number of blocks. Right. And, then when you and when it comes to the foreign key case, well, the nature of putting in your data, uh, well, I'm, I'm thinking here order, order lines, it's that type of pattern, the, the nature of the data insertion means that your child rows will go into the same block in this heap table, or very likely to go into the same block in the heap table. So when you do your search down through the foreign key index, you come through the root block, the leaf block, or root block, branch block, leaf block, all your data, which is the child data, in that style of case, that, that case where there's an automatic clustering by time anyway, you're visiting one table block and you've got all your rows. Right. And you can probably do this with, um, with SQL Server as well, but uh, Oracle allows for what they call compression on indexes, which technically they should call deduplication. If the leading columns of an index are repetitive, you can tell Oracle that it doesn't have to store the leading columns once per index entry. But hmm. It can, it can uh, store the index entry, the leading columns once, and then right. sort of cut suffixes. Uh, we don't have that yes. mechanism, so we don't have that kind of a compression, you know, uh, a reduce, re reduction of, of storage. They will, if you've got an index with multiple values, we'll yeah. store it. Um, yes. It'll be a very inefficient index, but, but we will store it. The, the interesting thing is, is that to yeah. get to the heap table, yeah. we don't have a direct jump to it. We have multiple jumps that we have to go through. Uh -huh. um, so it, it, it is less efficient. It is not stored in the same fashion. Um, mm -hmm. Further, the physical structure of the disk and disk storage makes the heaps less, less efficient because instead of going to, you know, looking through a key and retrieving data from a leaf, you actually have to, um, even if you have an index involved, you have to go through the through the key down to the to the leaf, and then hop across the disk to whatever page might actually store the data. So it becomes extremely inefficient, um, both both from a, just a general logical processing, but also from the physical processing that's required. Right. Okay. Um, I have to say, to a certain degree, I sometimes just put aside what goes on in terms of the disk accesses um, because a lot of the efficiency on OLTP systems tends to be about the blocks which have already been copied into memory. Right. Um, but perhaps uh, there's, there's similar sorts of following the point of type games that you have to the server even if you've got your, your data blocks cached. But yes. You well, see, with, with, Oracle, with Oracle, when you look at the leaf block of an index, you have the absolute um, block address and row within block for the row that you're interested in. So the very next thing that Oracle does is say, go and get this block, go to this specific row, very, very efficiently. Nope, not, not for heaps. It's just a different critter. Yeah. You've, got, you've yeah. got to go through the row ID lookup, and then that's got to go through the, um, the IAM pages. So it's, it's just not the same. I think I think that's I think that's the one breakdown point where we're not identical, yeah. and that's at least partly because of Windows, not not so much SQL Server. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. That, that that is interesting. I, I have to say, I mean, the, the way I've looked at, um, I've, I've done a few of block dumps and played around a little bit with SQL Server. Um, I have noticed in the past that heap tables in SQL Server were less flexible and were perhaps prone to causing more problems than heap tables in Oracle. Uh, for example, um, you have a fill factor in uh, SQL Server for indexes. Um, right. the, the, the approximate equivalent, or virtually the equivalent in Oracle would be uh, the percent through. Um, the fill factor, of course, is what percentage of the leaf block is full is used before you declare it full. Um, the percent free is what percentage of the block should be left free when you want to declare the block full. So you know, it's 100 minus fill factor equals percent free, okay? Um, so in SQL Server, it looks as if heap tables don't have a fill factor. Except when I was poking around, it 
seems to me as if there was a de facto fill factor of 95%, which means you need 5% of free space for updates to rows in the heap block. Um, right. Now, that potentially is a little bit on the small side and you can't control it. The other thing about it is that SQL Server, it, again, looking at block dumps, I, I could be wrong, SQL Server seems to say, I will let you insert a row and then I will check whether you've gone over this fill factor. And if you were doing sort of the row inserts, multiple row inserts, it was, I found it very easy to fill a heap table right up to virtually 100% full. And then of course, if I updated a row, you had to chain that row, you had to move it to a completely different block and leave a forwarding address for that block. Right, yeah, and, and that's and that's the thing with the page, the way the pages are distributed through heaps, they, they, they yeah. just scatter themselves across disks. It's not yeah. pretty. Yeah, yeah. So, so in a way, it's, um, it's not surprising that you have such a strong bias towards clustered indexes, uh, because it, it does seem as if there's, oh, I don't know how to say this without sounding a bit rude, it does seem <laughs> as if I'm just decided that clustered indexes are such a good thing, they're not really going to bother to, to make uh, heat tables all that efficient. They don't really seem to need them very much, and they, they can do good enough things with, with one technology. So why make the life complicated by doubling the amount of code that you have to write in order to support another technology at the same time? Well, pretty much. And and the and the interesting thing is is that the the clusters become such a a fundamental part of the structure that other mm. technologies are built on them, such as um, partitioning. If you've got if you've got large um, data management issues and you're going to partition your data across multiple disks, across multiple servers, you have to have a clustered index. Um, if you're using SQL Azure, you must have clustered indexes on your tables. Um, mm -hmm. If you're doing um, uh, spatial indexes, which I mentioned earlier, you also have to have a clustered index first on the table. Um, there's more if I could come up with. Um, we probably should examine a misconception or two, though, since we're on that topic. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, do, do you want to throw, throw uh, uh, something that you might be a misconception of how Oracle works? Um, well, I mean, actually, I've learned a bunch already. I had no idea that um, index organized tables were almost exactly the same thing as clustered indexes. I'm just shocked mm -hmm. that, that, that they don't. I don't know. I mean, if, if, you, if you read the descriptions of the two to me, I would assume that there was an increase in, in uh capability and performance by using the indexed organized table. So that's that's a personal misconception, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, as I, as I said, they're, they're not used very much in Oracle, and they should be used far more than, than they are. Um, I mean, historically, they came to Oracle relatively late. I think they appeared in Oracle 8, which I have to say that was 12, 14, 14, 15 years ago now, I can't remember exactly. <laughs> I remember when that one came but, out. But, but heap tables, I mean, heap tables were, were the, the first thing, and clusters were the second thing. Right? And interestingly, although the Oracle Data Dictionary makes very strong use of clusters, in fact, in order to be able to have multiple tables storing their data in shared blocks, right? so you can actually say to Oracle, in effect, I've got an orders table and an order lines table, but the order lines for an order should both go in the same actual page of data. So Oracle uses them fantastically. And I don't think I've ever seen a production application which uses Oracle clusters. Hmm. But in that organized tables, people are more likely to use, partly of course because they conceptually they're, they're, they're more familiar, they are feature indexes. Right. And even there there are a couple of interesting points with I mean the, the drawbacks to index organized tables from an Oracle person's perspective is that the whole table row gets attached to the primary key, which means you might not get very many rows in a single block, and it's a feature structure, which right. means that if you get uh, sort of in, in, intra-block insertions or updates, you may find that you get leaf block splits, and your index leaf block has to be shared across two other index leaf blocks, and the, the sort of extremely tidy structure of each index starts to degenerate a bit. Yeah, um, well, we run into those issues too. I think, yeah. I mean, just, yeah, sorry. I was yeah. just going to bring up one misconception from SQL Server because it's, it's a very, very common one, yeah. is, the, um, is that because clustered indexes are the default, yeah. um, an assumption amongst large groups of people is that um, only 
the index, only the primary key can be a clustered index. And um, that's, that's just one very, very common issue that people run into is that they assume that only the primary key is the clustered index and, and they, don't, they don't look at other alternatives. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's one of our, our bigger issues. Like I said, from the, from the design standpoint, because it's the default, people just let it go and, and, and that's all they do. Yeah, and that's, that's interesting. And if there's one, one of the things I've found when I was reading up civil service stuff is the fact that amazingly you can have non-unique index, index uh, non-unique cluster indexes. And what a significant benefit this would actually be, and if Mr. Newman is your comment, that there's this need to find it, it's stuck on the invisible stuff in the end of it, but it didn't have to be the primary key. Uh, and that, that struck me as a significantly useful feature um, because it did make it so easy to arrange data the way you wanted it to be. Oh yeah, it orders it. It orders it extremely well and makes for very, very efficient retrieval. I mean, yeah. um, I'm I'm a huge fan of putting clustered indexes on foreign keys um, because it it you know you get you get a massive massive increase in performance. Yeah. Yes, I think um, I think this is this is the, the big point with the, the index organized table which uh, I keep making. But, you know, I mean, you, you imagine something like say um, um, a stop. Uh, stock open system, which is recording prices from stock exchanges around the world. You know, that each day you get prices about 10,000 different stocks, but when right. you get to query it, what you want to query is this stock over the last 30 days. Well, if the data is in a heap table, that means for 30 days of, of one stock, you have to visit 30 different places in the table. But if you have a class of index on the stock code, 30 consecutive days of data are in one big block, or 60 consecutive days of data are in one big block. Right. So it's, it's brilliant in terms of putting the data into the right place as it arrives, because you can get it out so much faster. Yep, yeah. that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. What, was our next, uh, what was our next slide? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> Unless there's any questions. So, I can't see the Q&A yeah. panel, so. Yeah. I, I think we've been, we've been doing uses and abuses. So, uh, oh, yeah, that's true. We, we have been. <laughs> uh, I think we've slightly uh, sort of, uh, bypassed any, any problems to do with the new gender or anything. Yeah. That's so, all right. No worries. I, th I think the discussion has been great, and, and I think uh, from the feedback we've got, we've got a lot of questions in, uh, which I'll put you both towards the end. So the way we kind of loosely structured it before we kick the discussion off, was the misconceptions and uses and abuses, but I think maybe it might be quite a, a good time to move on to common grounds. What, what do you think? Well, I, sure. I think we've, we've pretty much covered all three topics in, in, <laughs> in one bit of discussion, haven't we? I, mean, the, 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 um... I, I do agree. I think I, I, I just find it, I really do find it interesting that the, um, that the heap retrieval within um, Oracle is definitely different than it is in SQL Server. I mean, that's, I think that's the one thing that's, I don't, I don't want to say saved, prevented, um, or, or in some ways, you know, changed whether or not you guys use your index organized tables more. Um, but, but it certainly, I think, is, is the, it's the main reason that you're not seeing a lot more of those because um, if it was less efficient, if it was more in the lines of SQL Server, you'd pretty quickly be getting a lot more index organized tables put to use. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, yes, of course, it, it, there is also just simply, we do this because we've always done this. So, you know, new right. technology, it doesn't matter if this is new technology that's 15 years old, it's new technology, and we, we never do that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, you know, yeah, they, yeah, let's yeah. talk about Oracle and ANSI join sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's not talk about that, because I, I just love the ANSI standard, because everyone's got their own. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, it's, Oracle ANSI doesn't run on SQL Server, and SQL Server ANSI doesn't run on Oracle. Well, no, there's, true. There's, there's this sort of core, which does obviously, this interesting variation. That's another discussion. We can have another one of these later. Um, yeah, and the, the, uh, another uh, follow-up, of course, is uh, in, in terms of misconceptions, perhaps, or uses and abuses. Um, there is still uh, a fairly hard core in Oracle who just loves to go around rebuilding indexes. And I got the impression that um, there's, there's a fairly common uh, assumption that you have to rebuild indexes all the time in, in SQL Server. Now, I don't know if that is true or not, but certainly from the uh, sort of viewpoint of 
index organized stables, because they have bigger entries in them, fewer entries per page, people worry a little bit more that they have to keep rebuilding index organized tables to keep them as efficient as possible. And is, is this something that goes on really in SQL Server? Well, SQL Server seems to fall into one of two camps by and large. Either people don't do any index maintenance and, and therefore suffer greatly, mm -hmm. or they do a little too much. Um, as, as you say, they, they rebuild too frequently. Mm -hmm. um, and while there's a cost to that, um, there's also a benefit. And I think, I think a, a certain percentage of people uh, fall into, you know, they're, they're paying too much for, for what they're getting. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that cost isn't that high, and the benefits are, are decent. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, do think some, I do think some people rebuild too frequently, but, but I, would, I would rather see too frequently than not at all. And our main problem is not at all. Indeed. Right. And certainly from the Oracle perspective, partly of course because almost everyone doesn't use index organized tables, um, the problem tends to be that people do far too much rebuilding indexes when they really don't need to. Oh, right. And, and of course, it, it sort of comes down to this trade-off, which is how much extra benefits do you get by doing your rebuilds? Right. Um, and and a friend of mine, um, Adam Mechanic, has, has long said that, that the benefits of rebuilding indexes are just not that good. That, mm -hmm. that uh, the, the number of extra reads that you see on the disk to, to avoid skipping the, uh, you know, to avoid skipping pages and whatnot, it's not that, it's not that high a cost. Um, I agree with him, just not 100%. Um, I, I've seen, um, reordering the indexes um, benefit and you know I mean it's it's never huge but it's always there and if you've already got other issues why not pay that cost get that index reorganized you know save your system a little bit of work and and then try to get the other stuff that you need to tune tuned as well yeah and that's uh, that certainly makes sense to me I and mean, it's um if if I, mean, I, I I tend to be in the camp of you don't rebuild indexes unless you're really very confident that there is actually something worth doing, worth saving, because you're not actually going to get very much benefit out of it at all. And there may be side effects anyway, but uh, I, I always take the view that there will be a few cases where it is definitely worth doing, that perhaps you really ought to do it, because those are very key, they're, they're focal points in your system, they really matter. So even that little extra bit could be worth gaining. Right. I, I, I'm always on the this slightly suspicious side. I mean, if you come back to the, um, the stock exchange example, right? If you've got a, a heap which is your stock exchange data and the B2 index, well, if you rebuild your index, you make a small improvement to the quality of your index, but your query is still going to visit 30 different places in the table. So, whatever work you've done rebuilding your index, the benefit you get is bound to be smaller. And right. Really, to, to a strong degree, that's why. Uh, rebuilding indexes in Oracle is likely to be much less relevant than it could possibly be to a SQL Server system. Well, and, and of course, you know, there will be the cases where, where it's worth considering. Well, and on SQL Server, if you have if you have a heap, yeah. no, you know, no cluster. If you have a heap and yeah. you do a rebuild, which is possible, by the way, a lot of people say it's not possible. It is. It's just a pain in the bottom. Um, but after you do that rebuild, any any non-clustered indexes on that heap. Um, they all have to be updated as well because the yeah. location of the, the storage has changed, so they actually have to get updated. Um, whereas if you rebuild a clustered index, it does cause a rebuild on, on the non-clustered indexes, but they're not getting updated. They're just getting rebuilt as well. Um, it, it's, um, it's, I don't know, it, it, it's a big trade-off. I mean, I, I would, I just stay away from heaps because I find them too costly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm wondering whether this is a, a good time to move on to the, the Q&A. We have sure. quite a few yeah. questions that have come in, and, and I think these, these questions are probably going to generate some discussion anyway. Okay. Uh, so once again, Jonathan, there has been a little bit of, of kind of sound fluctuation, so uh, if you could try and keep the mic close to you whilst, 
whilst we go through the Q&A. Uh, let me just scroll down and, and find the first question. If I brought the mic any closer, I could put toothpaste on it and clean my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, so the first question, uh, quite an interesting one to, to kick things off with, is from uh, Robert uh, Schloke, I, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, uh, and he's asking, why are Oracle's crudest and oldest storage format heaps being compared to clustered indexes? What about Oracle IOTs and clustering, etc.? Well... Shall I answer that since I've been talking about them? Um, someone chose a topic for a discussion. Heap tables are used enormously in Oracle, and IOTs are not used enough. Sorry, Jonathan, you, you've, you've gone a bit quiet again there. I, 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 I ah. couldn't hear that myself. Right, okay. Um, okay, well, the, the, the main thing, of course, is uh, you've got one person from Oracle, one person from SQL Server doing a talk, a discussion, and heap tables are the things which are used enormously in Oracle. And as I said at the beginning, IOTs should be used more. They aren't used more. It seems quite a good idea to have a discussion about the differences between IOTs and heaps, um, because amongst other things, it would expose Oracle people to the possibility of using IOTs. Great. Thank you, yeah, John. That, that makes sense. I've got another question for you, Jonathan. This is from uh, Craig Musser. Thank you, Craig. In an Oracle cluster, is the index covering the entire row, or is a row lookup required to retrieve other columns? Uh, in an index cluster in Oracle, you can have many rows in the same um, block. In a heap. It's effectively a heap structure. You have many rows which have the same key value in the, 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 the main columns. The index on that cluster holds each key value once. And then, when you do your lookup, you get a, a B-tree uh, search, a B-tree probe, which identifies the block that you need to go to to get all the rows that you're interested in. So, for example, again, going back to my stock, um, um, that's a stock prices uh, example, uh, you might have um, 100 prices for stock code ORCL in one block in the table, the cluster index would have one entry saying ORCL goes to block number 17 and file number 93. You jump to that block, you can pick up 100 rows for that particular stock code. Now I have to say, by the way, having said that, the stock code isn't a good example of using index clusters because you know, you've got thousands and thousands of ORCL quotes and you end up with Oracle saying that's the first hundred jump to this block to get the next hundred jump to this block to get the next hundred and so on. But the principle is one key entry gets you to every single row that's identified by that key value. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this question is for you, Grant. This is from uh, Yuz Shi, so I hope I pronounced that correctly as well. Uh, can SQL Server, can the SQL Server index be built on di a different data file, a you know, data warehouse? Clustered index is not a good option. Uh, Does that make well, sense? I would I would say clustered indexes are generally a good option. Yes, almost in almost all cases, um, unless you can prove otherwise. However, yes, um, indexes can be built on um, different data files. You can um, you can set it up however you need to. You can create new file groups or new files within a file group, and um, specifically assign those as part of the create index um, to go to that file group. Um, so if you need to put those on a separate index, oh, I'm sorry on a separate um, disk, um, you can do that that way. Um, by the way, though, a non-clustered index that is a, what's called a covering index, and I'm sure it's the same term in Oracle, um, which means it, it includes every column needed to satisfy the query, that really is one of the most efficient mechanisms for both storage and retrieval. It's, it's frequently better than a uh, clustered index, um, depending, right? I mean, <laughs> if you have to say it depends on every statement, but yeah. Can I throw in a point? SQL sure. Server does covering indexes much better than Oracle does. Um, in Oracle, you can add the extra columns you want to an index, but they become part of the B tree structure 
Ah. So they actually dictate the sequence that you walk through as you walk through the index. Whereas in SQL Server, you have your index, which dictates the order in which you visit rows. The extra columns that you can add to it, I believe, are in, in a way that they're, they're sort of floating attachment. It's just some values. They don't cause the index rows to, they don't have any effect on the order in which the index enters themselves as stored. True. They're, they're, that is yeah, a terrifically enormous benefit in SQL Server as well. If Oracle did it, they, they would solve some of their optimizer problems. <laughs> cool. Uh, in a sense, it's, 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 it's very much like an index organized table, the, the covering index, of course, because right. you're just saying, I've got an index, and I hang a few extra columns on the back end of it. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is very similar, very similar structure. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is from Kevin uh, Jernigan. I'm not sure who this is actually for, but uh, he's saying, doesn't the clustered index approach require you to know the access patterns in advance? What is the application requirements change over time? Well, yeah, he's right. It does require you to know the access patterns in advance. Yes. Um, what if the ap applications change over time? Well, boy, let's face it, applications change over time. That's, that's absolutely true. But having worked for an insurance company where I actually had to maintain some data, not much, but a little bit, that was nigh on to 100 years old, the interesting thing is the applications change over time, but the data doesn't change much. Um, the data largely stays as it is you know, for, for long, long periods of time. Um, but, but the applications do change. Um, if your data access patterns radically change over time, then you probably need to restructure your database. Uh, no other way to put it. For me, I mean, I don't know about the Oracle point of view. I totally agree with that. I love your comments about the data not changing, but the application does. It means so much that the database should look after the data and protect the data, and the manipulation of the data should be uh, um, defended, in a sense, by the database. You know, the front end, what you use to access the data is, is uh, much less important, really, than making sure you've got your data right. And this idea of, you know, you've got a problem with you, your, your clustering requirement changes, it's only marginally different in Oracle, where you can turn around and say, well, if I use the index organized tables, I'll have to change how I do that anyway. But even if you've got a heap table with B3 indexes, you've got to think about what's your index access path. What is my critical set of indexes? It's the same problem, just slightly different focus. Right. I agree. Thank you. It was a good one. Uh, we've got a question from Mark Williams here. Uh, in Mark's experience, Oracle has been focused more on concurrency. Is there any potential advantage in regard to concurrency that Oracle's default of heap tables would offer over SQL Server's default of clustered indexes? Huh. Well, I think the, that perhaps depends on uh, Grant's comment that many people think the SQL Server you have an identity column and that's your primary key and that's what you cluster on. Because I think if you do that all the time, you have a concurrency problem because every single row you insert is in competition with everyone else who's trying to insert a row. And, and in the old days, in, in SQL Server 2000, there was an N70 and 6.5. There was a, um, we had severe problems in SQL Server on exactly that. Um, it was uh, hot spots, right? That was the big thing, hot spots, hot spots. And so anytime anybody put an ID value and made that um, the cluster, uh, the cluster key, um, you ran into the risk of having, um, you know, the last page on the, on the cluster became like the, the place where all the action occurred. Um, they've changed, and, and I'm not going to be able to get the internals out of my brain really quickly, but, but they changed the way that that was approached um, in 2005, and it became much less of an issue. Um, but, but I couldn't tell you all the internals for why. Mm -hmm. not, not, not quickly. <laughs> I'd have to look it up again to reacquaint my brain. Of course, having asked the question about SQL Server in particular, uh, it is fair, I think, to point out that many systems that get created these days uh, especially ones being generated by um, application painters and all the rest of it, 
uh, simply build a heat table in Oracle, but add a column which is generated either by a sequence or by some code at the front end that uses a sequence number, uh, effectively an identity. Um, and then every row has to go in order, and they create a primary key on the sequence. So uh, it's very easy to find applications where Oracle has emulated the problem that SQL Server has, not exactly by default, but you know, has with its identity and primary key. Right. And so Oracle doesn't need to have the problem, but lots of people make sure that it does have the problem. <laughs> And I think this, this next question also uh, is an interesting point. Uh, this is from George Torres. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, so he's saying that consider that if you have a, a history table, basically one that stores dates of visits, if you put a clustered, the B tree will soon be unbalanced. And if you store the history in a heap table, the recalled reading will be a mess. How would you solve this? I'd have to ask, first of all, what you mean by unbalanced. Because in Oracle, and I'm sure it's the same in SQL Server, e tree indexes are balanced trees. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not sure what he means. I mean, unless he's saying that as you accumulate data, more and more of the data is newer and newer. Um, Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where he's going with that. I mean, honestly, it probably, I mean, I'm, I'm not that I would cluster on date. It's not necessarily something I would pick for a cluster. But if I did, I would expect it to actually be reasonably efficient. Okay, I mean, Mark Williams. Uh, I, I'd have to drill down on, on what, what we meant in that area. Yeah, I mean, what's, what, what do you mean by unbalanced because there's no such thing? And what do you mean, well, how, how do you envisage this history thing working? Because there are various reasons why you might or might not want to be clustered on date. In history, I would tend to think, oh, there's something you cluster on client, because if you want to look at history, perhaps you want to look at the client's history type of thing. So, yeah, sorry, can't answer the question too late. <coughs> <laughs> okay, George, maybe you could clarify that in, in the question panel, but I mean, Mark Williams is also asking a, a, sort of a, a comparison question. Uh, he's asking, are there any locking considerations which are vastly different between Oracle and SQL Server? Oh, boy. And this is when we've got, what, 30 seconds left? <laughs> <laughs> we've got quite a few questions, so I mean, I, I hope uh, you're both okay, and I hope the audience is okay to hang around for a little bit longer. We, we do have a good chunk of questions. Uh, I'm not sure okay. if, I can, if we can cover all of the questions in today's sessions. The questions that we can't answer, uh, we'll put up, uh, we'll put all the questions actually up on allthingsoracle.com. Uh, we'll link to there and we'll put it up on simpletalk.com as well. Uh, so hopefully we, we can get some answers to all of the questions. Right. Uh, I'm fine with it, um, with, with staying on. Um, different locking mechanisms? Oh gosh, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't know Oracle locking that well, um, so I'm assuming that they are radically different. Um, now, whether or not those locking mechanisms are reflected in, in the structures they're using, well, honestly, on, on a SQL Server side, yes, yes, they are. If you're doing, um, say, a table scan um, on a heap, and you're hopping from one row to another row to another row as part of that scan, each one of those rows could be inside of a different page inside of a different extent on the disk, and each one of those pages would get a shared lock put on it as it was doing this scan. So uh, say a scan of, of, a, of a heap could be a, an extremely expensive operation inside of SQL Server. Um, you can try forcing row-level locking, but SQL Server, while it has row-level locking like Oracle, it's not absolutely as efficient at it as Oracle is, plus putting hints on a query um, to try to force behavior because of other design problems usually leads to even worse performance problems in the long run. And, and that's my short answer on the SQL Server side. Yeah, I think on, on the Oracle side, my short answer is you can't even begin to talk about locking until you first sort out the multi-version concurrency control, you know, multi-version control, whatever you call it. The fact ah. that with Oracle, every read request is a read-consistent read request. 
that when a query starts, there is no locking that takes place on reads at all. Um, there is simply the fact that Oracle says, I will note the timestamp, technically the, the SCM, the system change number, I will note the timestamp when this query started, and as I scan through any data I want, I will check the timestamps of all the changes that have occurred, and I will visit the history, which I've got in so there's this thing called the undo segment. It contains information about how to reconstruct the data to a, an earlier point in time. So Oracle does not do any locking on reads because it goes back and says, the data I'm looking at now isn't the data I should see because it has changed since it started. I will reconstruct this one. Right. I should so mention or, SQL Server does have that mechanism. It's something you have to turn on intentionally. Um, and, and there's about, I think, two or three different um, layers or two different, two, three different strategies you can adopt on there. Is that long? Yeah. I'm sorry, did, was that a question? Or? It was a question. I didn't hear it. Oh, right. Uh, oh, dear. Um, it's, it's, aren't, aren't there something like two or three different strategies you can adopt to how you make your queries read consistent or dirty read or... Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, dirty reads and whatnot, but, but, yeah. but the version reads you're talking about, we have, we have, we have two. Oh, um, right. one, one is set per database, and, and that's um, read committed snapshot. And that's more or less roughly the way you outlined is that it, it has a, a, a version, you know, a history of the stuff, so it's not putting the same kind of shared locks on, on the tables um, yeah. as, as when you're not using that. But that is something you have to intentionally turn on. It's not on by default. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, a question here from uh, Brian Major. Uh, I think Brian uses both Oracle and SQL Server. Uh, and what he's interested in is that in SQL Server, what is the best way to deal with a table that holds data as part of a loading effort, such as a stage table? For instance, data is taken from a flat file, put into a stage table, and then every row is processed and placed into a base table. In Oracle, he just uses heap tables since we don't really care about the order. I guess that one's for me. Um, it depends. Um, how are you pulling the data back out as part of your retrieval? Is it only row by row? In which case, sure, use a heap. If, it, if it's just literally I'm going to pull it back out in the same order that I pulled it in, I don't have any kind of aware clause, you know, there's no any kind of filtering or anything at all, then yeah, you could just use a heap because you're not going to, you're not going to lose a lot and you're not going to gain anything by ordering the data as you put it in. But if you've got any kind of filtering in place um, or ordering, either one, um, then I would definitely recommend using a clustered index to, to either help the filtering or help the ordering, or both. Thank you, Gob. Uh, I have a, a controversial question here from Jonathan Stevens. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> and Jonathan's asking, is it a misconception that Oracle outperforms SQL Server where clustered indexes are concerned. <laughs> you can have this one, John. <laughs> um, you mean if, if uh, Grant sets up some sort of model using clustered indexes and then tries to emulate it using the organized tables and Oracle, which system would do the best on the same hardware? So, so Jonathan, you've gone a bit quiet again there. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so, so is, is this uh, along the, uh, the, the idea of Grant sets up a system using clustered tables, some test in, in clustered tables in SQL Server, and I see how close I can get to the same performance by using IoTs in Oracle? I, I think so. I think what, what Jonathan's actually leaning towards is that you could get better performance out of Oracle over right. SQL Server where clustered indexes are concerned. I think it would depend very much on exactly what you are trying to achieve. Um, I can imagine that there, there are a couple of features to index organized tables which SQL Server doesn't have, which in the correct circumstances could make it very easy for Oracle to do better than SQL Server. And the two I'm thinking of here are you can have compression on indexes in Oracle, so your index organized table could deduplicate the leading edges, leading columns, and therefore produce a smaller structure for the same data. 
you can also create an overflow segment in index organized tables in Oracle, which means you could say effectively, I will only keep columns X, Y, and Z in the index bit of it because those are the ones I use all the time, apart from the prime, apart from the key, and I will put the other 20 columns into what is effectively a, a heap table because I hardly ever use those. But if Grant gave me an example of his code and he said, and here's my set of queries that must be really fast, I could engineer an IOC which is smaller than his cluster index and put all the stuff he hardly ever looked at into the overflow and perhaps produce something which, for that limited test, performed better. Right. Well, I mean, and frankly, I'm not getting into the, I'm not getting getting into the uh, uh, um, to to the fight. Oracle's a good system. I have oh, yeah. no issues with it. Um, yeah. I happen to use SQL Server. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's, that's it's, it's, it's a, it is a silly fight. Um, yeah, and I mean that's that's I, I, pretty I, much I, I as far as I'm going to go. Yeah, I, I, I was trying to make the point really that you know if you look at what your requirements are, you can engineer the best out of either of those systems. And if you gave me something, I might find a way of engineering Oracle in a way you can't. If I gave you a problem which Oracle could do well, you might find a way of engineering it a SQL Server, which I can't. And I've seen this thing really uh, interesting. If you look at the TPC, TPC, TPC benchmarks, right. Oracle seems to focus on TPCC. Microsoft seems to focus on TPCH. Yep. They do not compete head on on the TPC. Yep, it's not very true. Maybe, and actually, maybe it's TPCE, I forget what it is. But I I'm notice, pretty sure it's H. But it, right, okay. Yeah, I did notice that when they want to brag about how fantastic they are, the two companies choose different benchmarks. Yeah. And that, that should tell people that, yeah, there, there are features that each product has which work best in the right circumstances. Right. Thank you. I, I don't. I don't think we uh, expected, uh, with uh, sort of two to three hundred people, that we weren't going to get one question that was going to try and uh, provoke <laughs> a, bit, a, a bit of an argument about, about that performance. So I'm, I'm glad we got it in there early. Okay. Uh, we've got a uh, uh, another comparative question, but not quite as provocative, from uh, Derek Colley, and he's asking what the difference is in the way that index fragmentation occurs in Oracle and SQL Server. Again, he, he, does, he does clarify a little bit further by saying, even in Oracle, the heap table uses the equivalent of a SQL Server IAM to hold a pointer to the exact block and row location in memory stroke disk, then surely heap tables will be more efficient in all cases unless the index is completely whole. Sorry, could you repeat that last bit? So if in Oracle the heap table uses the equivalent of a SQL Server IAM, is that correct? To hold a pointer to the exact block and row location in memory stroke disk, then surely heap tables will be more efficient in all cases unless the index is completely whole. So again the question was what are the differences in the way that index fragmentation occurs in Oracle and SQL Server? Well, I mean, it, it, fragmentation is very simple. If you delete a row, um, there's now a hole, right, where that row used to be. Um, that's part of fragmentation. If you insert a row and there's not enough room, there's a page split, and um, there's now you know uh, um, two pages where there was one, and the and the row gets added. The difference between the storage is is that when a page splits occurs on a heap, those pages go wherever. They can go before, after, between, who knows, they're going to go someplace on the disk. You don't know where, it's just the next allocation page. Um, whereas the page splits with, within an index are always still within the B tree. They're always going to be within the B tree and they're always stored within the structure of the order, at least on SQL Server side. Um, and so as far as the, the heaps becoming more efficient, um, they're still not. It's just when you talk about scans, if you're talking about scanning the entire range or, or large sections of the range, a heap might be more efficient, assuming the fragmentation hasn't scattered it all across the disk. And if we're talking about not an SSD, but like, like a good old rocker arm disk, 
then that arm's got to move back and forth across the disk over and over again to try to find the data for the scan. Whereas in a in a in a cluster or even a non-clustered index, it's at least going to be able to scan it in the order of the of the B tree. And while while the storage may be split, the, the pages may be rearranged somewhat, they're not going to be rearranged the way they are in a heap. And so heaps don't become more efficient. They become less so. Especially as things as things um, um, fragment. Thank you, Don. Yeah, from, from the Oracle side, I'm very unenthusiastic about the word fragmentation because people are inclined to ask about fragmentation without defining what they actually mean. Um, I think the grant covered the key points that if you delete an item from a block, from a page, there is some empty space which may or may not be reused sometime in the very near future. Um, and given a B tree in that structure, if you insert data, uh, some extra item into a page, there may not be enough room and therefore the page may split, which means that you end up with two half empty pages. Of course, that means we've got some space which may or may not be used in the very near future. Um, and you've also got this thing that the two pages are now some distance from each other, so the two sets of rows that used to be in that page are now separated. There has to be a jump from one page to the next at some point. Um, if you don't actually sit down and describe what you're trying to uh, investigate in the documentation, it's very difficult to decide how significant you can uh, I was interested in Grant's comments about heaps actually um, doing page splits. It's, it's, it's clearly so very, very different in Oracle, it's not relevant to ask the question. Um, table blocks, heap table blocks, do not split in Oracle. You don't say this block is full up, so I've got to move some of its data somewhere else. So unless I've misunderstood what, what Grant was saying, heap tables in Oracle are just literally like great long lists. Um, and when you filled up the, the space you allocated to one megabyte or the eight megabytes of a consecutive chunk of a file that you have filled in Oracle, you allocate another large chunk and just carry on filling that. So there's a, a, a much greater degree of uniform usage of space and continued continuous scans through space in Oracle than the sort of description that grants in given. Thank you. We, we do have a, a number of questions. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time to answer, but I'm, I'm, looking, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, attendance and I, I think a few people are, are dropping off. But as I mentioned before, I mean, the session that we've gone through uh, has been recorded. So we will uh, post this up. Uh, there will be a transcript as well, which will, which will take a, a couple of weeks to actually go up. Uh, and all these, these questions that haven't been answered will also go up somewhere. So hopefully we can get some answers to your question uh, if we haven't been able to answer them. I'm just going to finish off by uh, uh, putting one more question to the presenters uh, before we move on. So again, I do apologize if we haven't been able to answer your question. Hopefully we can do that in a follow-up over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so so the, the last question, oh, there's a few more questions coming in. Uh, so let me just scroll back up, sorry. Okay, so the last question I want to put, which I think is quite an interesting one, is from Pavan uh, Kumar. Thank you, Pavan. Uh, and he's asking, if indexes in Oracle split over a period of time, uh, it depends on the data, does SQL Server have this issue? And how does the SQL Server architecture handle uh, data splitting over time? I think it means new block splits. And I'll pass that back to Grant having said that comment. I'm, I'm a little confused. Over time, in th I mean, it's only going to split if there's um, inserts occurring or updates. Updates, sorry. Um, so assuming that there are updates um, or inserts that cause a page split, it's more or less as I, as I described. Um, the, pa the page storage itself will split. Um, you'll get a new page allocated. Um, 
half the rows will get moved to that page. Um, the update will occur either in place on the on the old page or on the new page. Um, over time, that continues. <laughs> uh, there's nothing else to say. At some point, um, you will start to see that hurting performance, depending on your queries and whatnot. Again, as as I said, Adam Mechanics says disks are so fast now that you just don't need to worry about it. But but I, I've I've seen somewhat where where you do need to worry about it. But over time, um, that will change, and it will cause performance to go down. And so then you have to do a rebuild. Um, um, an index rebuild, or you can do a. Uh, there's ways to rebuild the heap, but um, that's that's the way you fix it over time. Is that you you have to to defragment. Okay, that's, that's the best thing I can come up with for based on what was said. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just gonna just gonna put the contact details for everybody here. I, I don't know whether Jonathan and Grant want to sort of finish off with with a couple of comments. I think we've covered uh, an awful lot today, and I, and I hope you've enjoyed it as as much as I have. But uh, contact details for Jonathan, please contact Jonathan through his blog, uh, jonathanlewis.wordpress.com. Uh, Grant Fritchie's blog as well as scarydba.com. Um, please follow Grant at, at G Fritchie. Uh, and my contact details, you can email me at james.mercer at redgate.com and follow me on Twitter at all things Oracle. So I would just like to finish off by thanking everybody for attending and thanking Jonathan and Grant for taking part in I think which was in which I thought was a great discussion uh, and I hope everybody enjoyed a slightly different webinar and I hope everybody has, has learned something. It's great to hear that, that Grant and Jonathan both seem to have, have learned something as well so I think that's very good. Okay so thank you Grant and Jonathan and I'd just like to finish off by saying goodbye to everybody and I hope you all have a nice evening or daytime depending on where you are. Thank you for, for joining us today. <laughs>